Yes, indeedy, folks. It's the Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. It's time to drive the John Day River. I have relatives over in Oregon, so I go over that way fairly often. And of course, I've driven the freeway many times. The Highway 84 is one of the most beautiful freeways in the country, a great drive over to Oregon. However, I do like those back roads. Through the center of Oregon, there are two different back roads. Highway 20 from Vail through Burns and over to Bend goes through a lot of long desert drives. It's a spectacular drive if you want to go check out some, some desert country. Highway 26, on the other hand, goes up over the Blue Mountains through John Day and then along the John Day River until about Dayville and then from Dayville, the river leaves the highway and the highway goes on over to Bend. In a future drive, we will be taking a fascinating diversion from Highway 26 up along the John Day River from where it leaves the highway. We'll be covering this area in here. We will go through the beautiful Picture Gorge and up the John Day Fossil Beds National Monument, a great gorge. And instead of following Highway 26, which I've always done before, we'll take off on Highway 19, which follows the river instead of the highway. This route takes us up through Kimberly, Spray, and Service Creek before we leave the river and go back over a summit and back to Mitchell on Highway 26. This is a great drive. We're looking forward to taking it, but that's not what we're doing today. Today we are looking at the route from Vail over the Blue Mountains and to John Day and we'll probably make it all the way to Dayville. The drive immediately out of Vail goes up a long valley up Willow Creek, beautiful farms on each side, and then you hit the first sign of entering the Blue Mountains, 30 mile an hour curve. Trust me folks, you'll be seeing plenty more of those. This substantial kern sits at the El Dorado Divide between Ironside and Unity. It sits right where the road takes off for the Secret Valley Ranch of the Monument Rock Cattle Company. Now the Monument Rock Cattle Company might have to do with this being a monument on the Oregon Trail, I'm not sure. Actually, I just researched that and found out that Monument Rock is a mountain, not a pile of stones, so never mind. And this is the view looking from the pile of stones. That's the road to where the cattle company comes in, looking out on Highway 26 toward the west, toward the beautiful Blue Mountains. Here we are passing through Unity, the last town of any size, before we cross over the Blue Mountains at Dixie Pass. Just before Dixie Pass, we can turn off into a delightful little campground. This campground has some remnants of the old Sumpner Valley Railroad in it. After a pit stop, a picnic, and or an overnight stay, we cross over the Dixie Pass at 5,280 feet. Where we immediately hit a commemorative trail to the old Sumpner Valley Railroad. You take a little walk down this trail to one of the places where the railroad branched off. 
The railroad was affectionately referred to as the Stump Dodger Trail because the extension from Sumner was to go up and get the logs out of the mountains. There were a few other things, some farming supplies and some mining things going on, but mostly it was up there to bring out trees. And here we have a little view of the trail that you walk down in order to go exploring the old Sumner Valley Railroad right up there on the top of Dixie Pass. From Dixie Pass, Highway 26 makes a long, beautiful descent down into Prairie City and John Day. few miles before Prairie City, there is a monument to the pioneers that settled this valley. From the memorial, Highway 26 continues to descend 2,200 feet from Dixie Pass down to beautiful John Day River Valley. John Day itself is a thriving little community of some 1,800 souls. There are all sorts of amenities, including cafes, gas stations, and hotels. And there is this beautiful church. From John Day, we drive 38 miles of very lush valley and majestic mountains over to Dayville. And then there is Dayville. This is it, folks. A good old country store reminiscent of Orville Jackson's in Eagle. That's Sam with his two girls out front of the store. Sam's the horse. Sharon is the lady standing on the porch. And Mary is the young lady on top of Sam. I sent Sam, Sharon, and Mary a copy of this photograph titled Sam and His Two Girls. They tell me they put it up next to the front door. Maybe if you ever get over that way, you can check it out and tell them hello for me. And that concludes today's travel adventure. The great ride from Vail over the Blue Mountains and into the beautiful John Day River Valley. Next week, we will leave Highway 26 and follow the John Day River up around Highway 19 and 207, 
This is a spectacular drive, folks. We're looking forward to going on it. And next week, we will be introduced to my most sophisticated equipment yet. Yes, folks, the car cam. The car cam. You won't want to miss it. Car cam. Car cam. Car cam. Very sophisticated. Remember, kids, don't try this at home. Car cam! And now, let's go adventuring in the land of faith, knowledge. Take your pick. Today's discovery on faith, knowledge, take your pick has to do with two very different stories of six very specific days. I always enjoy it when folks tell me that we use, should use taxpayer money to pass around creation myths. I always wonder, well, which creation story do you want us to tell? I particularly like the one about the creation coming from an opening lotus. That's a beautiful, beautiful story. And there are many, many thousands and millions of faithful people who follow that as a creation story to enjoy and to celebrate. I suppose there are some who accept it as the very word of reality, but uh, probably most of them just enjoy it as, as a myth to, to carry around in their hearts from their childhood. I suppose when we're always looking for stories to, to explain things to us, there are many, many beautiful, beautiful creation myths that people of faith have carried over the years, and I enjoy many of them, including the two that come down from Genesis. What amuses me is that so many people who want us to be teaching biblical creation myths don't know that there are several creation stories in the Bible, and two of them are the very first two chapters of the very first book. Basically, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. They tell quite different stories about those six days that God was creating our world. Shall we take a little look at that? So let's look at these two stories that tell the story of the six days of creation. The two distinct and different stories of creation that are found in the first two chapters of Genesis. The first two chapters of the first book of the Bible. The first story is told on Genesis 1 verse 1 through Genesis 2, verse 3. It overlaps into Genesis 2 just a little bit. The second story goes from Genesis 2 all the way through to the end of Genesis. This includes the begats and the begots. It includes the story of Noah. It includes many, many stories. And it ends with Joseph getting his many coat of many colors and being thrown in the well and going to Egypt and bringing the tribes of Israel there and establishing the tribes of Israel in Egypt. And verse 26 is when Joseph dies and is buried in Egypt. However, we're not really interested in all the rest of that. What we're looking at is the stories of creation, the two stories about the six days of creation. Basically, it breaks down to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Let's get a little bit of history, shall we? Our first etchings, our first attempts to leave marks and notations that other people could read or know we were around, from what we can tell, go back 32,000 years. That's when the first cave paintings that we have found so far have been were, were made. Now, like we say, that's what we know so far. Who knows what other caves are out there, what other discoveries are to be made? Does this mean that people weren't communicating before 2000, or 
32,000 years ago? Obviously not. We would not be here if those cave teenagers hadn't found some way of saying, gee, I think you're cute. You want to go on a date. So we're not talking about human com communication as far as oral or physical uh, communication goes, but as far as making notations, having gone from making notations in caves up to where now we are using radio technology to try to reach out and communicate throughout the cosmos. For the purpose of this story, however, we're going to look at these 4,000 years right here. And those 4,000 years are from when the pharaohs started building the pyramids 4,600 years ago up to today. We have divided this time basically in half. It was divided by the Roman Catholic Church and the division line that they used to establish things was the time of Christ. Particularly, they say the birthday of Christ, but we know that that's off, at least according to biblical re records, and probably just simply because there were not that many birth certificates around in those days. We really don't know when Christ was born. So we have the current era and the before the current era, and we're particularly interested in this thousand years before the current era, the, the thousand years that span from 2,000 to 3,000 years ago. This was a time when writing was becoming more common. More and more people knew how to read. More and more people knew how to write. And many, many traditions started to write down their stories. All over the world, there started to be a growth of books and stories that had always been oral traditions and now were being written down. And that is when we start to see these stories in Genesis being written down. Obviously, we don't know how long they were oral traditions, but we do know more or less when they were written. We can study that by styles of writing. We can study it by when we find manuscripts. We basically know that the first story in Genesis, basically Genesis 1, was written by the Deuteronomy and priestly authors about 440 years before the current era. That would be about 2,500 years ago, the Deuteronomy and priestly authors were writing what is the first story of creation in the Bible. Now the second story of creation in the Bible, that that's found in Genesis 2, was written by the Yahwist authors. That was written 950 years before the current era, or very close to 3,000 years ago. So, even though it's the second story in the Bible, the Yahwist author's story was written 500 years before what is now the first story in the Bible. It doesn't really matter too much that the oldest story is the second story and the younger story is the first story, but it's kind of an interesting observation. And that is where we're left with the two stories as to what they are, where you find them, and when they were written. So now that we have seen where to find the two stories of the six days of creation in the Bible, and now that we've seen a little history of when these stories were written and by what authors they were written, let's take a look at the stories themselves, shall we? Let's look at the difference between the two stories, story number one and story number two. Day one, story number one, God creates the heavens and earth and light. In story number two on day one, God creates the heaven and earth. Day two. In the first story, the firmament, which is a brass dome over earth, was constructed and the water divided. Now we have to remember in the first story, in, on the first day, heaven and earth and light were made. Apparently, water was always there. In the second story on day two, a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Uh, it doesn't really say that God made that mist, but we could assume that that were the true. In this one, at least water was made. Uh, there was 
a way that water came into the story. Day three. The first story, the waters, which had not been made, they just were there in the first story. The waters were gathered into seas, and then came dry land, grass, herbs, and fruit trees. Pretty well everything that we can associate with earth. On day three, God created in the second story a man out of dust, and he named that man Adam. So in one story, on the third day, we have the water being made into seas. We had dry land, grass, herbs, and fruit trees. According to the second story, we had some dust gathered up and made into Adam. Day four. In the first story, God made the sun, the moon, and the stars, which, interestingly enough, in the second story, he never got around to. Apparently, the sun, the moon, and the stars were always there in the second story. However, in the first story, on the fourth day, not having made Adam yet, he has come up with the sun, the moon, and the stars to complement the waters, the firmament with the brass dome over the earth, the heaven and earth and light. Story number two. In the second story, on day four, God planted a garden eastward in Eden and put the man in it. Pretty well the story of finding a place for his man to live has become the story in the second story. Day five. First story, the fishes, the fowls, and the great whales are made. In the second story, he created the beasts and the fowls. Well, at least both of them agree on the fowl. I don't see any fishes or great whales on day five, but we got that pretty close. At least the fowls are there. And finally, on day six, this day before he rested, on day six, according to the first story, God created the beasts, cattle, every creeping thing, man and woman. It's interesting to note that he did not create Adam and then man. Rather, he created man and woman the same way and in the same mold that he created beasts, cattle, and every creeping thing. He created them male and female. In the second story on day six, God created a woman out of one of the man's ribs. So those are the two stories of the six days of creation. And this has been two different stories of six specific days. A special presentation of faith, knowledge. Take your pick. Tune in to the next episode of Faith, Knowledge, Take Your Pick, when we will discover that the Bible says Adam was not created in God's image. And now, a true story from the pearly gates of heaven. Starring St. Peter, his good friend Jesus, and a friendly old carpenter. Jesus is nothing if not a kind and thoughtful soul. So one day he was sitting around in heaven doing heavenly things, and he got to thinking, well, you know, St. Pete has been out on those pearly gates for a long, long time pretty much since the whole rigmarole began. I wonder if he'd like to take a break. So Jesus walked out to the pearly gates and he says to St. Peter, he says, Hey, Pete, he says, you know, you've been doing a great job out here, but it's been a long time. Would you like to take a break? I'm, I'm sure that I'm qualified to welcome people to heaven in, in your stead if you'd like to take a break. And 
St. Peter says, well, Jesus, that is very, very thoughtful of you. I, I sure appreciate that. It would be nice to take a little break. So St. Peter goes off to take the kind of breaks that you take in heaven. I don't know what that would be. But uh, he's, he's gone, and Jesus is sitting watching the pearly gates and welcoming people to the kingdom of heaven. And he's, he's kind of watching this old, old man walking up the golden path way, way, way down there. Guy doesn't seem to be any big hurry. He stops and smells the flowers and looks at the air and kind of walks along with his cane. He's going real slow. Lots of people pass him by. Takes him a long time, but finally he gets up to the pearly gates and he, he goes, these them pearly gates I've been hearing about all my life? And Jesus says, Yes, brother, they are the pearly gates of heaven. And welcome to the kingdom of heaven. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself before you enter into the kingdom of heaven? Well, the old man says, Oh, he says, There's not much to tell about me. I, I lived a long time ago. I... I worked hard, worked hard all my life. I was a carpenter, did good stuff. I guess people liked my stuff. They kept me real busy. I, I, well, just not much to tell. I had a son. I guess he became pretty famous, but I wouldn't know nothing about that kind of thing. Well, the more Jesus listened to this, let's see, lived a long time ago, was a carpenter, had a son. The more Jesus got to looking at him and wondering about him and thinking about him. And finally, Jesus got down pretty close to him. He says, Father? And the old man looks at him and says, Pinocchio? And that's another adventure in the Great Wahoo. Thanks for tuning in. Join me next week. We'll go adventuring along the John Day River as it leaves Highway 26. We'll look into exactly who the Bible says was made in God's image. And you know your beer drinking guide. I'll probably find something else to babble on about. See you then. And until then, remember to keep celebrating the Great Wahoo!